Whenever you have a patient who comes in with an extremely elevated glucose, you have to be thinking about DKA or HHS. Both of these conditions are related to a relative deficiency in insulin. And the characteristic symptoms of DKA or HHS are going to include polyuria, polydipsia, and profound volume depletion. Okay, but now let's list out the biggest differences between DKA and HHS. So first of all, DKA is typically going to have a glucose less than 800, and in fact, most of the time, it's gonna be somewhere between 350 and 500. And you may see that uh, glucose is less than 250 in euglycemic DKA. And remember, what's the biggest risk factor for euglycemic DKA? That's gonna be SGLT2 inhibitors. On the other hand, glucose in HHS is frequently above 1,000. So that's one of the first differentiators that you can use. In terms of patient population, DKA is typically associated with patients uh, who have type 1 diabetes mellitus, whereas uh, HHS is going to be more frequently seen in patients with type 2 diabetes. And the patient population tends to be younger for DKA patients, while HHS tends to affect more elderly patients. The onset of DKA is much more rapid, occurring potentially over the course of hours, whereas HHS is uh, much more insidious and occurs over very uh, many days or several days. In terms of symptoms that you can use to differentiate DKA and HHS, you may often see abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and shortness of breath with DKA, whereas in HHS, you're going to see more neurologic symptoms, for example, coma or stupor. stupor. In fact, up to 25 to 50% of patients with HHS are going to be obtunded or in a coma. Next, we'll take a look at some of the labs. And of course, DKA has ketones in the name, right? So you are gonna see ketones in the patient's urinalysis. So that's one of the key tests that we get for DKA. Whereas in HHS, you generally will not see any ketones. And in DKA, you are also gonna see a positive serum beta hydroxybutyrate, which is another uh, ketone that we can check for in the blood whereas you will have a negative BHB in HHS. And also you are gonna have an anion gap in DKA thanks to the ketoacidosis, whereas in HHS you may have a very slight anion gap, but generally we're gonna just say for the sake of simplicity that there's no anion gap uh, associated with HHS. Finally, for DKA, you are going to have a decreased pH, which goes with the acidosis uh, part of the ketoacidosis. And in HHS, you are generally going to have a normal pH. So these are the biggest differentiating factors between DKA and HHS. So very important to know the different glucose ranges that you'll typically see when these conditions present. And then just some of the differences in the patient population, the symptoms, and some of the lab findings. In terms of the initial workup for these conditions, it is very important to know that a lot of these conditions often have a precipitating event, especially for DKA. And it's up to you to find out what the potential trigger was for their DKA or HHS. So for example, one of the very frequent things that can cause DKA would be infection. Uh, so in general, we check a chest x-ray, a urinalysis, and blood cultures. Inadequate insulin is another frequent cause of DKA. You may also have compromised water intake, which tends to be more frequently seen in the elderly population and in the patients who uh, are presenting with HHS. And then acute major illnesses. Anything that basically stresses the body, releases a lot of hormones like uh, cortisol and epinephrine, these are all things that counteract the activity of insulin, leading to that relative insulin deficiency and subsequently causing your DKA or HHS. So I'm talking about stroke, so CVA, uh, myocardial infarction, pancreatitis. These are major things that could precipitate a DKA or HHS episode. Because of this, we generally will get a troponin, an EKG, and a lipase level as part of the initial workup for any triggers for a patient's DKA. And then finally, as part of the initial workup, of course, we get the urinalysis to check for ketones. We get a serum beta-hydroxybutyrate. We get a VBG uh, to assess the uh, level of acidosis. 
and we get a basic metabolic panel to check the, our anion gap, and we tend to get these every four hours or even more frequently if your institution allows. Now let's talk about the treatment for both of these conditions. And essentially the treatment is going to be the same regardless of if it's DKA or HHS. And the number one treatment, the most important treatment that you do right up front is going to be fluids. And you're gonna be very, very aggressive with fluids because these patients are profoundly volume depleted as we mentioned earlier, because they've been having this osmotic diuresis from the high sugar levels in their blood. And so generally you're gonna be giving them either normal saline or you're gonna be giving them half normal saline. And this really depends on uh, if they have a low, low serum sodium. So if they have low sodium, then you will give normal saline. And if they have normal or high sodium, then you would give half normal saline because you don't wanna give them too much sodium and cause them to become hypernatremic. This is continued until their uh, glucose is less than 250, at which point you add a dextrose solution to uh, the fluids. And the reason is because our next treatment is actually gonna be insulin. So insulin is obviously gonna drive our blood sugar down, but sometimes we have to continue the insulin drip for longer, even if the patient's glucose has normalized. So we start to add dextrose to the patient's fluids. Once their glucose uh, drops below 250, that way we can continue to use the insulin drip without risking a hypoglycemia from the patient. So number two is insulin. And so you're gonna be using an insulin drip uh, generally, uh, an insulin drip is going to be the most uh, rapid and effective way of treating DKA, especially if it's severe DKA. So we have um, definitely in severe DKA, these patients are generally going to go to the ICU and they're going to get an insulin drip. But if you have mild to moderate DKA, there is actually these uh, newly created subcutaneous uh, DKA protocols where they use actually just short acting insulins to, uh, to treat the patient's DKA. So for mild to moderate DKA, consider a subcutaneous DKA protocol. So generally, these uh, treatments are gonna be protocolized at your institution, and they're gonna have a whole order set that's already kind of built out for you, which should make ordering insulin and the fluids for patients pretty streamlined and pretty easy. And treatment number three is gonna be potassium. So a lot of these patients are gonna be severely whole body potassium depleted because they've been going through such a significant diuresis for such a long time. And if their potassium is very low and you give them insulin, you're actually going to start driving the insulin that's in their bloodstream into their cells. And that can further drop their serum potassium levels and cause a very dangerous situation where you may cause an arrhythmia. So if their potassium is less than 3.3, then you need to hold insulin and you need to give them potassium replacement before you start the insulin. So remember, potassium less than 3.3, don't start the insulin yet until you get the potassium up. And even then, once you've fixed the potassium, because you're gonna be giving them so much insulin, you actually start to add uh, potassium into the fluids. And this again will be in your institution's DKA protocols. Um, and that will help maintain their potassium because all of that insulin is really gonna just keep dropping their serum potassium. So you really need to stay on top of replacing it. Treatment number four, and this is not always used, but this is gonna be bicarbonate. And it, this is really only if the patient's pH is less than 6.9, then you can start them on a bicarbonate drip. If their pH is above 6.9, it is not recommended to start a bicarb drip. Taking a quick look at the different categories of DKA, uh, remember that mild DKA and moderate DKA, you can consider the sub-Q DKA protocol. Whereas for severe DKA, these patients are generally going to go to the ICU and they're generally going to be started on an insulin drip. This is going to be kind of institution dependent though on where these patients go. But some of the major things that determine uh, the severity of the DKA is their pH. So if their pH is less than seven, then you consider it severe DKA. And if the patient is in a stupor or in a coma, again, you consider it severe DKA. Whereas mild and moderate DKA have a less severe drop in the patient's pH. So while we're doing this treatment, we're generally checking the point of care glucose every one hour, especially on patients on an insulin drip. And uh, we are checking the BMP uh, about every four hours. And you want to continue the insulin drip or the subcutaneous DKA protocol until anion gap closes times two.
So for example, let's say the patient's initial anion gap was 20, and then you continue repeating BMPs until you get one that's uh, an anion gap of 12. Then you'll wait another four hours to get the next BMP to make sure that's also 12 or under. And at that point, you will say that the DKA has pretty much resolved and you can transition them into a subcutaneous insulin regimen. So after that, transition to subcutaneous insulin regimen. So how exactly do you transition somebody off of an insulin drip to a subcutaneous regimen? So transitioning off an insulin drip. So one of the key points that gets brought up a lot is uh, you want to overlap your insulin drip with your first long-acting subcutaneous dose by two hours. The reason is it takes a little bit of time for that first subcutaneous dose to start to kick into effect. And you want to keep the insulin drip on during that you know, two hour period, because if you abruptly discontinue the insulin drip, you risk the chance that the patient will actually go back into DKA because there's that gap where they're not really getting good insulin coverage. And then the other thing is transitioning off of the insulin drip. We generally want to transition them to a basal bolus regimen. So the main question here is how do you calculate how much insulin to give somebody? And so the way that you actually do this is generally you're going to look at the uh, last six hours uh, of the insulin drip and then calculate the total daily dose of insulin, multiply by about 80% to kind of give a conservative estimate. You don't want to overshoot how much insulin you're going to be giving this person. And then split this 50% into their basal dose, which is the long-acting dose, and 50% into short-acting. So let me just give you an example. So let's say the patient's anion gap has closed twice, and now we're looking back at their last six hours on the insulin drip. So let's say from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., the patient received two units of insulin. And then from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., the patient received 1.5 units. From 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., they received 1.5 units. 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., they received one unit. 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., one unit. And 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., one unit. So that's the last six hours of their insulin drip, right? So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna add all of these up. So two plus 1.5 plus 1.5 is five plus three more units, so that's eight units. And then in order to calculate their total daily dose, we're gonna have to multiply this by four, right? Because this is a six hour period and we're trying to see how much insulin are they gonna be expected to use over a 24 hour period. So this would get us a 32 unit total daily dose of insulin. Now with this 32 units, uh, now we're going to multiply this by 80% to kind of reduce it a little and just be a little bit more conservative. So let's say that's roughly 26 units of insulin. And now we're going to split this 50% uh, into long acting. So they're going to get 13 units of glargine, which is long acting. And then they're going to get 50% uh, of that split up uh, into short acting units um, divided among all their meals. So uh, it doesn't work out super perfectly, but basically it's going to be about 13 units of short acting. So split among breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we can just say four units of aspart with breakfast, four units of aspart with uh, lunch, and then four units of aspart with dinner. So that's how you're going to calculate based on the last six hours of the patient's insulin drip, we're going to calculate uh, this subcutaneous regimen of 13 units of glargine and four units of aspart with meals. And then of course, you're gonna add your sliding scale insulin on top of that as well. I would say the most important things for interns to know is that number one, you absolutely have to overlap the insulin drip with your first subcutaneous dose by two hours. You're gonna be asked that all the time. So you just really need to know that like the back of your hand. And then also you really do need to understand how to calculate the insulin dosing off of the insulin drip. Um, that's gonna come up all the time and you're gonna have to really know that like the back of your hand as well. So this whole section right here is very important for you to know. All right, and lastly, I just wanted to go over some bonus pearls. Uh, that you may be asked about or may encounter. So a lot of these patients are going to have hyponatremia and pretty significant hyponatremia. But remember that uh, predominantly this is going to be because they have such severe hyperglycemia that you're actually going to get a hypertonic hyponatremia because of how much glucose is around. So you have to correct 
uh, for the glucose. Remember to correct for the glucose. So once you give these patients fluids and insulin and get that blood glucose down, you're really going to see the hyponatremia uh, tend to correct very quickly. Leukocytosis is actually very common in DKA, so don't be surprised if you see a, a leukocytosis to 16 or 17. This corresponds to the degree of ketonemia in patients with DKA, but if the leukocytosis is greater than 25, that is really suggestive of infection, like true infection in that case. And again, you're going to be doing an infectious workup anyways, so just be more on the lookout for infection, but don't be surprised if there is a mild leukocytosis in patients with DKA. And the last question is, can you eat on an insulin drip? The answer is actually you can eat if you're on an insulin drip. Um, so the answer is yes, but you have to add a subcutaneous insulin to cover those meals. So you have to add sub-Q insulin to cover those meals. So it's, it's a rare scenario, but sometimes you're going to have patients who do want to start eating while they're still on an insulin drip. In that case, continue the insulin drip, but add on uh, aspart with meals. And so the patient is going to be receiving both an insulin drip and short acting insulin on top of it. All right, guys, so I hope that helped with your understanding of DKA versus HHS. Remember the differences between the two. Uh, remember things that you need to work up for both of them and uh, the treatment, which is essentially the same for both. And then really, really, again, hammer home that point of how to transition off the insulin drip once the patient's anion gap has closed uh, twice. Let me know down in the comments below if you have any questions. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.